have you ever been somewhere and run and, and like witnessed two pregnant women in the same room? Have you ever seen that? We're going to take a little, we're going to play a little game, okay? I'm going to give you a couple of guesses. You shouldn't need but one of them to tell me what two pregnant women in the same room talk about. Anybody want to guess? Right, you don't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that if you're in the same room with two pregnant women, inevitably a, a, a chain of conversations is going to happen. They're going to talk about the fact that their back hurts. They're going to talk about how much weight they've put on. They're going to talk about how unsupportive their husbands are. And they're going to talk about babies. Right? I mean, that's just the chain of events when two pregnant women are in the same room. Today's reading, that's exactly the scene. Luke drops us in the middle of this really cool picture of two pregnant women. Now, they happen to be related, but, but they meet in the living room of one of their houses, in Zechariah's house, and, and they're going to have this moment of, of telling tales, and I'm sure talking about back pain or whatever. But you see, here's what's spectacular about this particular section of God's Word. These aren't just two random women who happen to be pregnant, who happen to be in the same room. No, the, these are two women that should never have been in the room to begin with. See, you have Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John, who is going to become the greatest prophet, that's what Jesus says of him, the greatest of God's prophets, and he is going to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And then you have Mary, who carries in her womb the very Son of God, who came to deal with your and my sin. This is not a normal chain of events that is happening in this scene. This isn't just two random women who run into each other in the aisles while shopping. These are two women who are the least likely candidates to be in this room at this time. Two barren, desolate women. In fact, if you flip with me just back from our reading in Luke's gospel, he begins the whole gospel account of Jesus by telling us first about Elizabeth and Zechariah. They're going to go to Zechariah and proclaim to him that they are going to have a son. And Zechariah responds by saying, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Elizabeth is in no place to be having kids. She's well past that point in life. She's well past the point of being a likely candidate to give birth, and yet it's going to happen. In fact, if we just skip down a little bit, Luke provides us some insight into the very thoughts of Elizabeth herself. She says this in Luke chapter 1, verse 25, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. And in fact, a few months later, when, when the messengers show up to Mary to tell her that she is also about to have a very unlikely pregnancy and birth, the angel actually says to her, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. Elizabeth had no place being pregnant. She couldn't have been. It was impossible for her on her own. And then we flip the page to Mary, and, and Luke's going to tell us a whole bunch of times that Mary was a virgin. In other words, shouldn't be having a baby, right? That's how the biology works. 
twice in one verse, in fact, he is going to declare that Mary is a virgin, and Mary is going to have a couple moments of her own here as God comes to her and says that he will reign over the house of David. Mary's response to the angel is, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Mary had no place being in a room talking about babies with another woman who had no place being in a room talking about babies. It was both phenomenally unlikely. And yet here they stand in Zechariah's living room talking about babies. Both of them there, uh, part of a long line of God doing the impossible. God taking nothingness and turning it into somethingness. See, they were both descendants of Eve, the original mom of all creation, who, after violating God's command, honestly should have been put to death and never should have been allowed to produce offspring and to populate the earth. And yet, God in his mercy allowed that to happen so that Elizabeth and Mary could stand in a room, a living room, several years later. Both Mary and Elizabeth were descendants of Sarah, the wife of Abraham, who was the original, no way, we're too old couple. Because God had come to them and said, we're going to give you a son in your old age, and they laughed. And yet, even the original barren lady gave birth to a son, Isaac, the child of the promise, is what he is known as. You can almost, by the way, standing in Zechariah's living room here, kind of the echo of laughter yet again as the impossible is on the table as possible. See, that's, that's what God does. Now, 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 I want to be clear, for those of you who might be here, and you might be saying, well, we're barren, and we've been trying to have children, or we're struggling, and God's not doing the impossible in our, in, in our, in our lives. We're not just talking about the fact that God just desires to give everyone babies. That's not the point. So please don't pigeonhole the conversation that narrowly. The point is that we worship a God, and today's reading is yet another indication of a God who can do the impossible, or maybe better stated, who can take nothing and turn it into something. I mean, this is the God who, at the beginning of all time, at least as we know it, took nothing and spoke into it, and there was light. This is the God who took a nothingness of a people, his people Israel, slaves, and, and this nothingness of people he turned into a great nation of priests on his behalf. This is the God who liberates the homeless and the widowless and the broken, all so that they can experience life with him. This is the God who takes nothing and turns it into something. In theological circles, there's a term for this. It's called ex nihilo, which literally means out of nothing. And only God has the ability to work ex nihilo. Only God has the ability to take nothing and turn it into something. Only God. The scriptures tell us that after they had had their full, all of the people who had gathered around Jesus, after they had eaten till they were full that the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. Only God does that. The scriptures tell us that Jesus, upon encountering this young girl, spoke into her brokenness and said, young girl, I tell you, arise. Talutha kumi, get up. And she does. Only God does that. Only God says to Lazarus, hey, Lazarus, come on down. And he does. Only God says to the apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfect in nothingness. Only God 
takes nothing and turns it into something. Here, standing in Zechariah's living room, we have evidence of a God who takes nothing, a barren woman, and a woman who has no reason to be pregnant, or having a conversation about the babies that they're carrying in their wombs. Only God takes nothing and turns it into something. Only God speaks into the barrenness of life and uses it for his purposes. And I'm thankful for that. Aren't you? That was pitiful. Maybe I caught you off guard. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Yes. That's better. See, you don't have to work very hard, by the way, today to see barrenness in the world around you. In fact, if you closed your eyes right now, if I asked you to do this, my guess is if I, if I had you close your eyes and I painted a very beautiful word picture for you about your favorite Christmas, whatever that means, assuming that you've had some beautiful Christmas in your past. I could talk about snow because there should be snow at Christmas. And we could talk about warm fireplaces. And depending on your age, we could talk about Bing Crosby or whatever that is for you. We could paint this beautiful, peaceful picture. And somewhere in there would be the innate human desire for something more. Now, maybe you missed what I just said to you. But isn't it fascinating that at Christmas, there's suddenly all of this, this good cheer and nostalgia and this quest for something bigger? Isn't that part of your Christmas? Peace to all, joy to the world. There's this, there's this innate desire, see? We understand that the world around us is broken and barren. In fact, if I had had you close your eyes and then I said, open your eyes, and, and what are the first five things to pop into your brain that you have to do this week or that you have to deal with this week, it wouldn't take very long for this idyllic little picture of Christmas to dissipate and for you to find yourself going, oh, yeah, that's right. <sighs> the world awaits. Right? Unless, of course, you're a student and you're on break, then you think, I don't know, my week's looking pretty good. It doesn't take much to see the barrenness of the world in which we live. And even though God is holding it together and preserving it for his purposes, we have certainly done a spectacular job of trying to mess it up. In fact, idolatry, covetousness, self-centeredness, argumentativeness, lust. We could go through the whole long list, and if we're honest with ourselves, we don't have to look a whole lot further than brushing our teeth and seeing our teeth, teeth is plural in and of itself, brushing our teeth and seeing our reflection in the mirror to see the implications of all of those words, Right? I mean, we don't have to look at y'all out there. All we have to do is look at ourselves in the mirror and we realize that, that barrenness is not just in the womb. Barrenness is in the reality of the human condition. We are broken and messed up and barren. Yeah? That, that's why I love what just happened here. Maybe you missed it. Maybe you just walked up or maybe you were freaked out about it. I don't know which way to go to get to the altar and, and that consumes you. Or maybe you're worried about this pastor going to grab the gluten-free wafers. But, but when we come to the, to the table, to the Lord's Supper, we, we in fact live out in a way this scripture verse. We, we come broken and diseased and messed up and delinquent and barren, don't we? We come with nothing. 
to a God who has everything, but this is the mind-blowing part, not only has everything, but gives his everything to us. Man, let that sink in for a second. We come with nothing, and the God who not only has everything, but gives us everything right at the altar, he gives us his very body and blood. That's awesome. See, in the Old Testament, there's a whole lot written about the sacrifice of animals, and specifically in the midst of those sacrifices, very particular care is given to what do you do with the blood. You know why that is? Because the blood, theologically, it was believed to contain the life essence, the life of the animal. When you come to the table and, and we give you a little wafer and we say, this is my body, and then we give you a little glass and we say, this is my blood, what is actually happening is the God of the universe is taking your nothingness, your barrenness, your brokenness, and he is applying his everythingness to you. He says, here is my life. Now, I don't know how you spend your time getting ready for Christmas, and I don't know what you think about day in and day out, but I'd like to just hang out in that little moment for a second. Because the implications of a broken creation, and more specifically, a broken John, are painfully evident to me, at least, and to some of you as well, because you pointed out to me. That was a joke, come on. And yet, we worship and celebrate a God who through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ demonstrates his incredible ability to make something out of nothing. That's what he does. That's what he did just moments ago. This Christmas, as you cruise in, you know, maybe you're leaving soon to travel. Someone told me this morning that they were going on a cruise. I'm a little bitter about that. <laughs> As you cruise into Christmas, be reminded that this is not, you know, turkey or ham or presents or lights. This is about a God who came to earth and was born of a woman that should never have given birth and was preceded by a man who was given birth by a woman who should never have given birth because this is the God of possibilities in the midst of the impossible. That's what God does. He takes broken people like us and he makes us his kids and he gives us his life and he shares with, with us his purpose. Amen? Let's pray. Father, you are good, and your mercy endures forever. God, we thank you. We thank you that you are capable of taking a stiff-necked, idolatrous, rebellious people like us and turning us into part of your holy people. Lord, we're thankful that you hold all of creation together, and that you have embedded in us this desire for more, more peace, more joy, more life. But God, remind us today that that is not found in ceremony or lights or hams. It is found in you and you alone, Jesus. God, we come to you barren. We come to you broken. And you give us life. Father, in the midst of a world that is far too messed up, far too rebellious against you, our creator, we pause and we celebrate who you are. The God of impossibilities. The God of grace. The God of mercy. The God that we can see clearly in the face of Jesus, this little boy born of a virgin. God, thank you. 
for loving us. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus, and the people of God said,